Thank you for joining us here today for this colloquium in honour of Peter Pratt. I think we'd all agree that his eight years at the ECB have been busy ones. They've seen a lot of changes in the way the central bank operates. They've seen a lot of changes in the toolkit, a lot of changes in communication. But the sense I got from covering the ECB and also from the panel this morning is that EMU remains incomplete. There are going to be changes in the years ahead to monetary policy and to the way in which the ECB operates. So this panel now is going to cover that. So I'd like to begin by asking all of our panelists, how do you see the ECB today and how do you think it will look in 2027? And I'd like to first turn to Adam Posen. Uh, thank you, Claire. Uh, let me thank all of you, and especially Peter Pratt and colleagues, for including me in this panel and in this conference. As many people have said far better than I, starting with the President, Mario Draghi, Peter exemplified a number of things that one actually enjoys and show up in the central banking community, but rarely do they all show up in one person simultaneously. Uh, academic insight, policy relevance, entertaining effect, likability, and conviction. And so it's very honored to be here with Peter. Um, so taking that in mind, I'm going to unusually talk a bit, frankly, um, and, um, <laughs> and talk a little bit about the convictions. As Claire noted, the previous panel with the very distinguished political leaders on it for, uh, for its own obvious reasons, emphasized the incompleteness of Europe, emphasized structural reforms, emphasized the issues outside of this building. Um, this panel is to talk about what's inside this building. And what I want to start with is to be international. Deputy Governor Gouloud talked a little bit about international, but mostly in the sense of compar comparisons, you know, is Europe doing well on this or that? I'm going to talk internationally to start because I think we have to remember that uh, all the major central banks are facing a common threat, uh, or rather two common threats. The, the first common threat is a variant on what Larry Summers called secular stagnation, what has many names, but essentially is the low interest rate, low investment, low risk taking environment that we can't seem to get inflation up. The second common threat is none of us, especially in an institution like this committed to liberal European ideals and transnationalism, wants to face what happens if the extreme right wing wins. And so these are two threats that I think are central, not just to the existence of the euro, but are motivating and have to be the central concern of all central banks at this time. But of course, the problems we've talked about, or let us say the challenges we've talked about, about the incomplete monetary union in Europe, make European Central Bank particularly vulnerable. That these threats you not only have to respond to for the good of Europe and the world, but that potentially these are threats that get compounded by the incomplete nature of the monetary mm -hmm. union. And so what can we think about that? How, do, how should we think about that? And there's essentially two ways of thinking about this. The first is to think about what was on the previous panel, um, to go forward and say, well, monetary policy can only do so much. Um, we stand at risk of losing credibility and losing popular mandate if we tried to do too much. And therefore, we're going to spend our time pointing out uh, where we think the priorities should be, especially where they touch upon our mandate. So calls for capital market union banking, further banking union, and so on. Um, and then you can always do that and sign on to every G20 accord that said, starting eight years ago, monetary policy is carrying too much of the burden, and therefore we need fiscal policy. The second option is to say, well, the extreme version is Mohammed El Arian's very apt title, only game in town, and to say, sometimes a little too arrogantly, we're the grown-ups in the room, we're able to act, 
we at least have the presumption we're acting on a non-selfish parochial basis. Let's try to act and sort out the rest later. Uh, it probably will not surprise you that I'm in the second camp. But what matters is not what camp I am, I'm in, or even nowadays not what camp Peter is in. It is what camp those of you who are still on the governing council and who will be succeeding Peter, like Philip, um, are in. And I want to very strongly echo something Mario Monti just said, which is, you know, the Banque d'Italia would sit there and say, we need the following structural reforms, and a week later, somehow those reforms had not happened and the remarks were forgotten, no matter how well argued and no matter how apolitically and persuasively they were put. And I think that looking back at the last 20 years, one needs to go beyond looking in the Euro area and saying just, oh, there hasn't been as much exogen excuse me, endogenous real convergence as we would like, but that the record of the ECB deterring and browbeating other countries into doing reforms is quite poor. And I think some of us warned ahead of time that was likely to be the case. But more importantly, I think you cannot look back at the last 10 years and say, OK, notwithstanding Klaus Regling's valid points about conditionality in the OMT and the ESM, um, that we have achieved a great deal of structural reform as a result of being tough or being conditional or being political with our monetary policies. And so when we face, and I forgive me for the arrogance of saying we, because I view myself as just part of this community, uh, when we face this dual challenge of a very low interest rate, low growth, low inflation world, and the potential for nightmarish political consequences if the system breaks down again, it seems to me that, therefore, there is reason to think much more aggressively about monetary policy in a way that the ECB has not done so far, or at least has not publicly done so far. Um, and so the first point is you have to think about essentially abjuring, withdrawing from the strategic game. Whether we can pick the country of your choice, normally in Southern Europe, I don't know if they're the good countries or not, to use Klaus's term. But, um, you know, just say the ECB has to decide it's not playing that game. It's going to stick to its knitting. But if it's going to stick to its knitting, it's going to stick to its knitting very aggressively. And so it is disappointing to see in the German press and other parts of the European press in recent weeks going back to old issues of lender of last resort and of the appropriateness, sorry, just checking the time, um, of the appropriateness of so-called unconventional monetary policy as a sort of symbolic gesturing to the German public over who's going to get to be the next ECB president. It is very disappointing because this is at best disingenuous and will cause problems later when reality intrudes and you're forced to reverse, or it is at worst a terrible mistake in understanding the role of the central bank in what we know is necessary and what Mario and Peter and Benoit and Vitor and others who served in this council um, demonstrated in the last 10 years. And so, you know, this isn't about who just gets selected to be president, and that's not appropriate for today, but it is to say that we should not hold back. Someone who does not believe that the lender of last resort is the basic function of a central bank and that that should go without saying is someone who should not be leading a major central bank. Full stop. And this is not a matter of personalities or nationalities. It is a matter of economic realism. Now, of course, what this falls up against is the idea that there is a central bank independence problem for the ECB that the ECB must be careful because it is a supranational institution in a context where European institutions do not seem to be doing that well. I think this is exactly wrong. Um, I echo some of the things Deputy Governor Galud said. If you look at what the 
approval ratings for the euro, the approval ratings for Europe in the current context, in part because of the foolishness of my alma mater in the UK um, being so visible to everyone, you have a lot of goodwill. Moreover, your independence is not under threat. The ECB went through some silly cycles at the start of the crisis worrying about the capital position of the ECB, which all of us in this room know is a non-issue. Um, we have seen through the ridiculous court cases. We know what we can do. Again, forgive the we, because I think it's about this institution that we're all invested in to help save and lead Europe. And so I think you should go back to something which I said long ago and which I hope you all recognize. The European Central Bank is the only central bank in the world whose institutional independence is preserved by international treaty. You are fundamentally more important and more secure than any other central bank in the world. And you've bravely used that, and you should think about that using that even more going forward. Be an advocate, don't worry about your independence. Hmm. So finally, in practical terms, and there are many people, many distinguished scholars and practitioners in this room who can debate with me and others very fruitfully, what are the practical terms to go forward? But I would just suggest two things. First, I know this is going to lead to my losing every future invitation at this bank forever. <laughs> <laughs> it's time for the major central banks to come together on raising their inflation targets. And no single central bank can do it, single major central bank can really do it alone. The 2% target, which I co-authored arguments for 20 years ago, has outlived its usefulness. The stickiness of inflation at low levels and the dangers of the zero lower bound and the credibility problems of not achieving such target mean that you need a more aspirational target. I realize this is not an open and shut case, but neither is it something that can be totally ignored at this point. The second point I would make is we're seeing a lot of discussion, quite usefully and rightly, about issues of fiscal monetary coordination. And this is critical, and I agree with my colleague Olivier Blanchard, as well as I'm sure many of you in this room, that the next main step for stabilization in the next crisis will have to come through fiscal policy. But I think there is more that the ECB can do and more that central banks can do in general about pre-committing their ability to purchase certain kinds of assets in larger quantities and how it would be done rather than waiting for the crisis and seeing how it gets done. I would just conclude by reminding people that everyone gets caught up in is it unconventional policy and what should you do? But the fact remains that what was called unconventional policy in the US, the Federal Reserve was about by all kinds of good assets as long as they were public and had to abjure all private assets. And in the Euro area, it was the mirror image that the ECB could buy many, many private assets or finance or discount many private assets but was not allowed to engage in buying too many public assets absent O and T. The reason I point out this mirror image is just to emphasize that there's nothing inherently unconventional. This is all about persuasion in your political context, and it would be good for the ECB to engage in that. That is part of its mandate. Thank you. Thank you. Adam, I think we chose you to go first on the panel because we thought you'd do a good job of firing the audience up. And I think you certainly lived up to that. I don't quite, I think I lost count of the, amen, the amount of sacred cows that got slaughtered in that, in that 10 minutes. So, so well done. Thank you. Um, I'd like to turn now to, to Isabel. Thanks. So thank you very much. It's a, a great honor and a great pleasure to be here on this panel, especially given that Peter himself is, is on this panel. Thank you very much for, for having me and uh, congratulations to all, the, all your achievements. It is very uh, impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, Claire asked us to talk first about the situation that the ECB is in right now. And of course, uh, this very closely connects uh, to what we've been discussing in the previous uh, section. 
uh, recession, namely that um, uh, that the euro area faces different kinds of weaknesses, financial, fiscal, structural. And this makes the euro area uh, fragile and it uh, may also impair monetary transmission. So when we think about financial weaknesses, uh, I mean, what I find still very important is the sovereign bank nexus. I mean, there are various ways in which sovereigns and banks are connected, both directly and indirectly, directly through the uh, sovereign uh, exposures uh, of banks, uh, through the implicit bailout guarantees, which are still there somehow, uh, and of course also through national deposit insurance, and then indirectly uh, through various channels um, uh, working through the real economy. And then, uh, it, it was men as was mentioned already, um, there is this issue of the segmentation of the European uh, banking and capital markets, leading to very little uh, private risk sharing. And then we have all these structural problems in the financial sector. So the European financial sector remains mainly uh, bank-based, which means that we rel rely very much uh, on uh, bank uh, financing. At the same time, the European banking sector uh, remains very weak, it lacks uh, profitability, and this is partly due uh, to uh, overcapacities. Then we have the fiscal uh, side, uh, so the fiscal framework is not yet uh, uh, fully uh, credible and tends to be pro-cyclical, and we have limited fiscal space in some uh, member states due to the high uh, debt levels, and there is very little fiscal uh, risk sharing at the euro area level. And then, of course, we have all the structural weaknesses, so there is a lack of uh, convergence, there's uh, even the danger of higher divergence, and the political constellations make structural reforms very difficult or even lead to a reversal of reforms. And the dilemma of the ECB is that it cannot really deal with any of these weaknesses um, uh, directly. So it has to rely on policymakers to deal with that, but the political process is very slow, and this is partly due to the fact that there is not really a, a sense uh, of urgency. I, I feel that very clearly in Germany, that there is not the feeling that the euro area is, is mm. unstable. So there is a feeling that you can mm. move on very slowly and eventually, uh, you may eventually get to, I don't know, EDIS, but uh, it doesn't really matter uh, when uh, that happens. And at the same time, uh, politicians um, um, uh, seem to have the idea that if there is another crisis, they can again uh, rely on the ECB to the same extent as they did in the, in the past crisis. But that may actually uh, not be uh, as easy as, as last time because, uh, in my view, there is less room for a maneuver. Close enough. And, um, and this is, uh, I mean, of course, the ECB can always design uh, new instruments, but, um, but these new instruments uh, may become increasingly uh, controversial. And I do think this could uh, threaten the ECB's uh, independence. And this constellation uh, with uh, limited fiscal space, at least in some member states, and this uh, limited room for maneuver of, of the ECB makes the euro area uh, fragile. And so where, where could the next uh, crisis come from? Uh, I mean, we're seeing the slowdown um, uh, of uh, economic growth in the euro area. I mean, it's not, it's not dramatic. It's just, a, it's just a slowdown, but the downside risks are enormous due to the trade war, to, due to the situation in China, uh, due to Brexit. And also there's always this, uh, this looming danger of a resurgence of a euro area uh, crisis. And what worries me a lot is that at the same time, uh, I believe the financial sector is still very vulnerable to a recession. And they are very much in line with what Matthias said. So many people are saying the financial sector is doing fine. It's much more resilient than it was before the, uh, the crisis. But I think this is actually a partly a misperception. So we've had this very benign period uh, with historically low default rates. This has, however, translated into very low loan loss provisions, very low uh, risk weights. And so uh, actually the bank capital ratios may not be quite as high in reality as they look. And also the decrease in, in NPLs may not be quite as, uh, as positive as it looks because if we enter a recession, bank capital ratios may adjust very sharply and the same is true for, for NPLs. We are also seeing that uh, there are some risks related to the low uh, interest rate environment. We see inflated uh, asset prices. We see search for yield of financial market participants, uh, a very strong maturity and uh, liquidity transformation. 
And so you could, of course, say, okay, that's not the business of, uh, of monetary policy. This is what uh, we have macroprudential uh, policy uh, for. Uh, but I must say, uh, if I look at what happened in macroprudential policy, I'm, uh, I'm a bit uh, disappointed. Um, we've seen a lot of inaction bias, especially when I uh, think about Germany. I, I see that very clearly. So there are quite uh, a few people who think, for example, that the countercyclical buffer should have been raised already some time ago. Uh, but, uh, but it's not happening. It's not happening because there are always good arguments not to, not to raise the buffer. So the, the risks are not visible, uh, uh, and uh, so why should you raise the buffer? And then at some point, people say, okay, now the recession is coming, so we cannot raise the buffer, so we can never raise the buffer. And so these counter-cyclical instruments are very difficult. The timing is uh, very demanding, and there is then the danger, of course, of these instruments becoming, in the end, uh, uh, pro-cyclical. At the same time, the SSM has never really used its topping up power, which should, I believe, be used in this kind of uh, situations. There is the ESRB, which I find an incredibly useful institution, but it's not, it's not very powerful. And of course, also, there's a lack of instruments. There are uh, not many instruments for macroprudential policy beyond banking. We also, my feeling is that we do not understand uh, macroprudential policy very well. We understand monetary policy uh, much, uh, much better. So we don't know really how to deal uh, with the potential uh, conflict of objectives between price stability and financial stability. Uh, we, we, uh, uh, some people discuss that macroprudential policy should become uh, more rule-based, and actually what I find very attractive is that you have these counter-cyclical instruments more as a kind of automatic stabilizer so that you get rid of all this political uh, decision-making uh, which uh, slows down the, the process. So is there a need to coordinate macroprudential policies internationally? And, so, and, and is the effectiveness of macroprudential policy limited uh, by the rise of uh, non-bank financial uh, intermediaries? So um, the bottom line for me is that it's not so clear how much uh, uh, trust we can have in macroprudential uh, uh, policy dealing with the financial stability issue. And then the question comes back to, uh, uh, to monetary policy. So what is the role of monetary policy? So I don't, I don't have an answer to that, but I think uh, we, have to, uh, we have to deal with that. Uh, so, um, uh, if I think about my, uh, uh, my vision of the ECB in 2027, 20, uh, I mean, I think the major issue is that uh, we should reduce the overburdening uh, of the central bank and, of course, completing the, um, uh, the monetary union uh, plays a crucial role there. And, I mean, we have to, uh, uh, I mean, we have to convince politicians that there is urgency, that there is urgency to complete the banking union, to break the sovereign uh, bank uh, nexus, uh, to, um, to create uh, integrated um, banking markets, financial markets. Of course, we also need sustainable fiscal policy so that there is fiscal space also at the member state level, but I think we also need some fiscal stabilization mechanism uh, in, the, in the euro area. And then, of course, there is the issue of structural reforms, and we have to think about how we can uh, raise incentives for doing that. But uh, we also should think, when, it comes, when I come back to financial stability, we also, we also should uh, think about whether we have burdened uh, the, the central bank in that respect. Because in the crisis, we have transferred additional tasks to the, to the uh, ECB. Uh, and I, I mean, there was no, I don't see what else could have been done, because that was one of the few very well-functioning institutions at the time, and there was no need for a treaty change. But uh, I'm not convinced that the current situation uh, is optimal, because of course the ECB has a primary uh, objective of uh, monetary stability, and not of fi financial stability. And uh, these two objectives uh, may be conflicting. So I think we should be open towards a discussion where, um, uh, where actually the, the supranational micro and macro potential uh, powers uh, could potentially be moved out of uh, the central bank to an independent cross-sectoral euro area uh, institution which has a clear mandate for financial uh, stability. So my feeling is that this issue of financial stability is not given uh, uh, the, the, the emphasis that it uh, deserves. And uh, finally, I think uh, we should uh, think more about strengthening the ECB's uh, crisis management uh, powers. Uh, so th I think there's very little discussion about uh, ELA. And, uh, I, and to be honest, I never really understood why ELA is at, at the national level. And I think we should get back to that discussion of moving it to the, 
to, to the uh, euro area level. I mean, I, I know that uh, many people, maybe my country, are not happy about that, but I, I think that would be very important. A second very important issue is that we have to deal with the question of um, liquidity for banks in resolution. This is a big unresolved topic. And again, I think this, is, uh, this would be uh, the role of the ECB, and one has to think about how to design it uh, properly. Uh, but that is another a very important issue, I see, and I would like to stop here. Thank you very much. Well, thanks a lot, Isabel, especially for raising this topic of macroprudential policy, which is another tool in the armory of central banks, well, at least in the sense that a lot of central banks now have um, some responsibility for it. But as you say, it's, it's rather new and not necessarily well understood. Um, can we turn now to Jean, please? Yes, uh, let me start by, by paying tribute to um, an aspect of Peter that hasn't been mentioned so far. Um, I think the reason why I'm here is that uh, back in 2003, when I was uh, busy uh, with uh, the project of Bruegel, I came to, to see you, and I discovered a sort of government sector venture capitalist in, in Peter, who immediately <laughs> assigned one of uh, the best brains in, uh, in the Bank of uh, Belgium. And then Mario Monti joined us. Huh? Yeah. That was before Mario Monti joined. That was before, yes. You <laughs> that was before. And, and so you assigned uh, Stéphane so to, to yes, Stéphane Stéphane Rottier, Rottier. so that yeah. um, there would be uh, someone uh, active, you know, uh, organizing the compromises that eventually led to Bruegel and uh, to uh, Mario Monti taking the chair the first. So, uh, I wanted to say that. Now, to answer your question, you know, what tower is the ECB in, uh, in, in eight years? I would wish to see it as, uh, as boring, you know, is it uh, mm. obviously uh, appropriate for central bank, uh, as gray because it's the color of the neutrality of, of money, and as less powerful, which is another way to say, uh, you know, it's not overburdened. Uh, and I think that actually this would ju just uh, show that P Peter is not needed because he's not boring. He's anything but boring. He's gray outside but colorful uh, inside as soon as he starts speaking. Mm. And he's, he's powerful. Uh, but uh, I don't think it's going to happen. And I think I would echo what uh, you know, the previous panel said, what Adam said, what Isabel said, that the overburdening is, is likely to, to, to continue. And I would go as far as saying that we see a very strange consensus, um, or at least a very strange trend emerging in this uh, debate uh, in the electoral campaign, which is consensus on the euro. Everybody wants to keep the euro, but no consensus on Europe. So the idea that we can keep the euro without uh, integrating uh, in, in Europe um, is worrying. Uh, it's understandable because you know it's uh, people want to keep the euro. They don't. Uh, they, they, they don't want to. Uh, uh, politicians to play with their, their currency, but uh, they are not willing to accept what it implies in terms of integration, in terms of, of uh, further liberalization, in terms of structural reforms. And therefore, the politicians are telling them, OK, we keep the euro, but, but Europe is not, uh, is not uh, part of the agenda. And this is obviously inconsistent, and that's going to uh, be a major challenge for uh, the ECB going forward. So in the spirit of uh, you know, slaughtering sacred cows, I would like to, to, to uh, complement a bit, because I agree with much what has been said, uh, addressing two, two uh, other issues. One is the fact that um, the, uh, the, the central bank, the ECB, is really about, uh, about price stability, is about uh, financial stability. We know the, you know, the, the, the mantra, we know the, the mandate. And there's a disconnect between that and what younger people care about, which is uh, inequality and climate change, probably the two most important things they would mention, which is obviously not in the mandate of a central bank. Uh, and uh, at the same time, you know, if you want to, to counter populist trends, uh, you have also to, to care about what society uh, is interested in. And uh, central bankers, including the ECB, uh, have been active saying that there are ways in which you know, they, can, they can take those issues on board. Especially you know, inequalities, there is not much it can, it can do, but, but climate change. And I think it has been done mostly through saying that there are financial stability ways to addressing uh, climate change and to warning the private sector. 
about the consequences of uh, underestimating the, the risk of uh, stranded assets and what it implies for, for financial stability. I don't think it's really uh, sufficient at, uh, in terms of uh, the way we, we should be dealing with, with climate change. I think for, for, for uh, two reasons. One is that we're speaking of a, of a major transformation that involves genuine trade-offs uh, in terms of uh, what we are able to sacrifice in the name of uh, having, uh, improving the, uh, uh, the, the outlook for, for climate action. Let me take the, the uh, situation today. I mean, we, we're benefiting from extremely low interest rate, uh, and we, we're benefiting from a windfall that comes from this uh, uh, lower, much lower uh, interest rate on public debt than anticipated even, even two years ago. We don't have any discussion in Europe on what it implies and how to use uh, this windfall gain. And if, is there, uh, is, does it make sense, actually, to use the a large fiscal space and to use uh, the, the windfall gain coming from the, the drop in the interest rate burden in, in public expenditure uh, to invest uh, in accelerating the transition to a low carbon economy. Uh, that's not a something that's part of the discussion and that's very strange, uh, I think. Uh, so, so that's uh, a, a discussion on which it would be important, I think, to have the view of the ECB. Now, there are also bad reasons for which the ECB could have to, to deal with that, is that there is, um, and that's another way of being overburdened, uh, I think there is likely to be a pressure on the ECB to substitute the lack of proper action by governments. Governments face a major uh, difficulty in changing relative prices, because climate change is fundamentally about changing relative prices. Um, this should be done, we know, the first best through a tax. Uh, this uh, is not being done, except in a few countries, like uh, Northern European countries. Sweden is uh, exemplary in this respect. Um, and so they are search for substitutes. Search for substitutes, uh, like uh, without being able to committing to raising taxes uh, uh, in, in a way that would correspond to the, the social price of, uh, of carbon or to the, uh, the shadow price of carbon uh, consistent with the, the Paris Agreement. Search for substitute is to use financial engineering as a substitute for it. And so they, they are increasingly uh, likely to be pressure on the ECB to actually contribute to, to, to that. Actually, it's, you know, it's part of the program of the, um, the, the, the party of President Macron that uh, climate change should be part of the mandate of every European institution, including the ECB explicitly. We don't know what it means, but it may mean that you know, there will be some sort of suggestion that the ECB should, should do that. So I think this needs a response on the part of central bankers. What do they consider is, uh, can be part of their, of their mandate? And what do they consider cannot be part of their mandate? So just to, to uh, mention two things. One is about uh, financial stability. Is it consistent to tell the private sector, you shouldn't invest in such an such asset because it involves a risk uh, that uh, uh, of these assets being stranded because of uh, climate change policy? And at the same time saying that in the monetary policy operation, the asset purchase of the ECB, you're perfectly neutral and you don't uh, distinguish between these types of assets. The second uh, issue is more sort of speculative. It's uh, the issue of uh, uh, the credibility. Uh, we are looking desperately for some form of credibility in, in climate change policy. There is no credibility currently in climate change policies. So the question is, you know, is there a way in which uh, an institution that has very strong credibility could help uh, support the credibility of those, uh, of those policy? Um, to uh, lending it to, to embattled governments. Uh, now, let me end on uh, the uh, second, perhaps, uh, cow I would like to, um, to deal with, which is the external dimension of, uh, of the EU, which we did not uh, address so much, uh, you know, implicitly, but in, in what Adam said. Um, it has been neglected for two decades for very good reasons, I think. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, there was this neutral stance, neither discourage nor encourage the external use of the euro, and that was certainly fine for the, the first two uh, decades of the euro. 
Um, and uh, Adam and I looked uh, 10 years ago into the uh, issue of uh, the external role of the euro and concluded that there were limitations uh, and that was, you know, this neutral stance was part of the limitation, not telling uh, external non-residents, you know, what the stance with the visit. Um, I think there, there, there are reasons to change that stance now. It's time to end the neutrality of the, uh, of the uh, ECB and uh, the euro area in general toward the, uh, the external role of the euro. Uh, one reason is that uh, we, for we Europeans, for many years, uh, for many decades, somehow considered that the, the US dollar was a, uh, the currency of the US, but was also some sort of global public good. And we, that we could rely on it knowing that they were you know, there was a privilege, but that was a sort of quid pro quo for the fact that uh, the U.S. was providing it to the rest of the world. Now, what, we, uh, what we've seen is that the Trump administration has clearly indicated that he doesn't want to uh, uh, manage uh, the, the, the dollar in various ways in the interest of the rest of the world, but in the strict national interest narrowly defined of the U.S., and not as the U.S. as a leader of the, uh, the global economy, but the U.S. as a, as a zero-sum game type of uh, country uh, that considers it has adversarial interests vis-a-vis other countries, possibly also uh, the EU. So that's one of the reasons why we should reconsider. The second, which is linked, is that we're most probably heading towards a multipolar uh, currency uh, system, currency world, and that we have to ask ourselves what role do we want to play in this regard. And so the commission recently published a paper on that. And the commission actually, uh, you know, in terms of the general stance, uh, started changing the, the, the direction, saying, you know, we need to do more for the external role of the EU. The question is, what does it mean in practice? And I think it means two things in practice. One, uh, which actually also echoes some uh, issues for domestic monetary policy is the, the question of the safe asset. What's the reference safe asset that we are going to offer the rest of the world? Is there, is, is there one? Uh, and I'm not speaking, obviously, of mutualization, but I'm speaking of the various proposals that were, have been made to, to create a, a safe asset with domestic benefits, but also significant external consequences, because if there is a safe asset of this sort, it means that for the rest of the world there is a vehicle to, to invest in. The second uh, uh, issue is the issue of the swap lines. Uh, we know that at the time of the crisis, the ECB uh, faced difficulties uh, providing swap lines to you know, non, uh, other central banks um, that uh, could help those central banks to serve as a lender of last resort in other currency, in the foreign currency, vis-a-vis -vis their own banking system. Um, the US did that. Uh, the ECB did not do that. And there, again, there are good reasons for that because it, it would have meant that the ECB would have uh, engaged in something it didn't have a mandate for. Uh, and actually that raised question of relationship between the ECB as a monetary institution and the political authorities, uh, selecting the partners to which uh, such uh, swap lines would be extended. Um, and also a treasury because uh, uh, swap lines involves a fiscal risk and the fiscal risk has to be covered in some way. So it very, was very understandable that at the time uh, we were not ready for that. I think the question, uh, the time has come to ask those questions and uh, again to, to reconsider this stance with all what it implies, uh, both in terms of the safe asset and the swap line. Thank you. My turn. Uh... <laughs> Well, first, thank you very much to be here. Um, you have noticed the diversity of the panelists, so I think that's the purpose also, and we heard uh, very contrasted views. I think what came out very much is the sense of urgency that was, I think, shared by each of us with different, uh, different uh, accents, of course. Now, you asked the question about 2027. What is 27? It's uh, Philip, you're there, no? Philip Lane. It's almost the end of your mandate. And it will be the end of the mandate of Louis, I think, somewhere, somewhere. It's seven, eight years from now. So I was thinking, uh, Philip, when you will be sitting here in eight years from now, <laughs> uh, what will be the farewell for you? And uh, 
Then that was my first dream uh, when I thought about this, um, is uh, actually you will have a good life compared to me, actually. <laughs> because, because, because the banking union and the capital market union, they will be completed because they will understand what we say. These, I mean, the policymakers, they will understand. So the sense of urgency, they get the message. So you get, a, you get a good conditions, actually. The second is indeed that uh, structural reforms will be taken and implemented, which means that the potential growth rate will be up, which means the natural rate will go up, that means the nominal rates will go up, and that means that you get rid of the lower bound issue that we had to struggle over the last years, Benoit and, and colleagues Eve and others here, and colleagues from the governing council. So that's, that's another good thing for you. Uh, there was another thing also which you will benefit very much, uh, uh, Philip, is that fiscal policy will be on a sustainable path in the different countries. Uh, and that as a result, all our discussion, of course there will be some outliers, but Klaus told us he would care, take care about the few outliers. <laughs> so the crisis management framework will work pretty well. Uh, Philip, and Philip and colleagues huh, uh, are still there also. Uh, and that means the safe asset problems will be basically solved because they're yeah. more sustainable. And uh, we take care for the tails, you know, with Klaus being there and uh, with some OMT sort of support, you know, in that uh, deal. So that was my first reaction when you asked 27. The second reaction then I suddenly uh, yeah, actually thought about, uh, that's a horrible story I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, it's Jean Monnet. I always had big problems with Jean Monnet. Uh, years, I mean, he's a great person, I, I guess, I didn't know him. I, I start talking like Trump, actually, when I do that. <laughs> a great, a great guy, it's a great guy. <laughs> By the way, I got beautiful letters, beautiful letters from people who are not here. <laughs> you know what I mean? With the you're, you're the smartest yeah. guy, you yeah. are the smartest guy. <laughs> right, 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 you got it right. Yeah. No, but I mean, it's, uh, it, is, uh, it is really something. But, <laughs> I'll go back to, the, no, but I go back to this question of communication very seriously just after. I'm very serious, actually, always, as you know. <laughs> I would not be, I hope, I suppose I would not be there if I was uh, not serious. But, no, but I had the other, the other Jean Monnet story, uh, which I think we should reflect. Europe, be, Europe will be forged in crisis. Mm. I mean, you know that, that expression. I was always horrified by this. Because it's a sort of top-down, you know, recognition of the elite, you know, that you create a tension somewhere. And that, uh, you know, the, the movement will go in one direction. So you, there are different examples. You lock in, for example, in the euro, there will be tension, someone, and in the end it will mean more integration exactly. from the top down and the population will follow. I always found it a horrifying story because this uh, sort of positive feedback loop, loop expectation, uh, I think it could the other way. It could lead to a destructive loop and not the other way around. So this, this Jean Monnet story, which I'm not the first to say that, huh? uh, but I thought that <laughs> since a long time, uh, and uh, there's been papers on this, as you know. Uh, I was thinking, Philip, maybe it's not my first dream, but it's my nightmare uh, that you will have to go through with the other colleagues being there. Because that's where we come with a sense of urgency, because you cannot expect, and maybe we're already in that situation, the population to just say, we need more integration, we need to do this. And it's true what uh, Jerome was uh, very fantastically saying, and then he has been pu punished you know, in the elections. He's a great person, again, <laughs> he's a great guy, uh, and, uh, which is true. Uh, but you see that in the, he didn't pay politically. And uh, that's also one of the reasons to bring these sort of people, and there are several in the rooms here. Uh, Pierre Carlo, where are you sitting? You are there. So <laughs> some of these people, you know, I see here in the room, uh, I can show them. Uh, again, I am using this communication uh, device that we see. Uh, but it is true that uh, we need to start to talk differently. Uh, and uh, I can do that, I think, to many people here. Because usually when I communicate, people say we hate what you're doing, but at least we think you're honest in what you do. And I will go to that sort of point, which is the first thing of communication, is we try to do our best within our mandate. And I will defend a little bit, very briefly, uh, that point of view, because sometimes it's a bit difficult, you know, from, from what you hear. Uh, so this, this question of Jean Monnet, I think, has to be taken very seriously. And uh, the communication to the people, actually, in a way uh, which they understand, of course. And that leads us to this, uh, I think, Sylvie, also, you mentioned that very often, this gap between, ah, they love the euros, <laughs> the euro, uh, but they don't trust the ECB, or they don't trust the commission, they don't trust their parliament, they don't trust the, the church, uh, they trust the army, I think, in general, I see that. 
But uh, this, this gap between you know, uh, what we think is good and the, the perceptions which you alluded also, uh, Jean, it's something any institution dealing with policy has to tackle that as a major problem. And not continuing to say the elite needs a response, that's fine. But you also need to communicate very much to the people what is it, what is it, uh, what is it not what we are doing. For example, for the central bank. Now we go for the central bank. The first thing I want to say with the central bank, I'm in this uh, central banking community, I joined it 19 years ago, so about 2000. Uh, and I discovered also via the BIS uh, club, you know, there are the positive, I think it's very positive, there are some negative images also, it's too close, you know, it's not transparent, all that. I think this has a major issue of stability in the global environment. I mean, uh, you have uh, there a number of people, I've, I saw them very committed to, uh, you know, the public good, you know, uh, basically stability-oriented sort of culture. And it has proven very much over the years as, a, as very uh, useful in the world environment. I would say that for other multilateral institutions. And so I defend very much not only the ECB, which came very much in the, in the discussion, but I would add something which has not been said very much, a your system dimension. I'm very grateful to all the colleagues of the governing council. Uh, and I, uh, uh, Claire, actually you asked me, do you have, a, do you have, a, a, do you have a, some uh, <laughs> advice to give to, to Philip, the new, the new guy? And uh, well, he'll, he'll well, I, I said, oh, well, I didn't. I give you my advice yet, Philip. But I, I think it's essential. It's essential to keep this uh, this uh, strong, you know, uh, group, uh, the team spirit, even if there are very different opinions on what should be done or not do. Uh, I think it's essential because diversity is essential, and that's what I always wanted in this panel: this diversity, this freedom of expressing different opinions. Now, of course, sometimes, sometimes it's difficult sometimes to listen. When I, I, signed, I signed my contract, uh, my side, the other side was by, I think, uh, Angela Merkel or Sarkozy, I think, and these are big names, actually, so I, <laughs> I just signed on my side. And it is true that uh, I, my contract, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I mean, your contract now, uh, it's a well, very simple contract, it's price stability. And uh, Isabel, you mentioned it also. And uh, now suddenly, suddenly, uh, I have uh, Eve. All the known objections that we get every day now, I say, no, sign such a contract. Actually, of course, they ask us to do that, and we are very loyally following what government. But it is true that this issue uh, where you have a central bank in a very difficult framework with low natural rate, you know, with financial shocks in a bank intermediate and environment, with very um, underinvestment, you know, in, in the in institutions dealing with financial crisis and all this. It's already a very difficult environment. You put it in, I think we did it uh, very successfully and we were extremely engaged all your system in that. So I think it's a great success, but it stretches the institution very much as you were saying. I don't, I don't say that we should change the environment or whatever. I just say this is an issue. As, uh, in the way you, you mentioned, we have to reflect on this. So we have a separation principle, but at the same time, we are asked every day almost to non-object, non you know, or object to some of the decisions uh, which are not final decisions from the supervisory board. I mean, so the, these, are, these are issues we, in terms of governance, we have to think uh, in the future. Although I think we, we did, I mean, uh, in terms of organization, also a uh, very good job. I really think that. Well, I was head of human resources, by the way, at that time, so I couldn't say the opposite. But it's true that we hired a lot of people in a very short period of time. I think that uh, some of the union's uh, representatives here in the room, it's true that also it was a very cooperative spirit with the personnel here in the bank when we did all this. The question, which I think was a bit more difficult, is uh, when we go into the... Um, well, into the mandate, actually, which is a very simple contract on price stability. We always heard this story, uh, you came too late, the rates were, uh, I, I looked a little bit at you, uh, Mario Monti, actually. Uh, we should have done more, and then we should have been done less later on, because we, we, we should have uh, not, because load for too long time means that you get more hazard, the spreads are not high enough to discipline the country. So we are used to that sort of criticism. I think we try to do the best in the mandate on price stability. In a way, you could say there has been, a, for government, sometimes a happy coincidence because you, know, you had low you know, price pressures, so you have to have low interest rates. There is an external externality on governments, they get a free ride because rates gone, gone up. But don't forget 
they should not forget market discipline is, is, is still there. So you, in the market discipline, you could say the discipline goes up to the run on the, on the sovereigns. I mean, that's a, mm. that's a dangerous market discipline. But when you get the spreads, you know, in a country like Italy, which they are now, you could say they, could, they should be higher to discipline the government. But I mean, you should, you should also see, you know, uh, what is the optimum level, which is very difficult to, lead, to do. So discipline is still there in the market. We have a number of proofs. You see, look at Portugal. Portugal at some point at a high spread, Vitor, you there, high spread. They have gone down, you know, after the signal was taken by government. Now, the, the essential question is all that in the terms of moral hazard and monetary policy. We are guided by the mandate. It's true that when interest rates are low, we had absolutely uh, risk on uh, deflation risk. I can eloquently, if you want, explain that in another forum. We acted very much. And of course, there are externalities, sometimes positive externalities for the free riders. And for these sort of issues, of course, when the crisis came, we had two issues. We had the banks and we had the sovereigns. On the banks, and that came after 2009, we have the Philadelphia, uh, you know, GD20, was it? And there was a, the weak pro quo, we provide liquidity, so that's moral hazard, not a problem. I mean, we, we just do it. And on the other hand, we want to be sure that there is a clear agenda of toughening regulation and all these things, which we did. Uh, and I can say we should do more, as Matthias was explaining, and, uh, and, and we should have other instruments, the macro pro and all these things. On the sovereign side, we did, and it's unfinished work. We put in place institutions with conditionality framework, and uh, with a liquidity provision with backstop in these crises. It's true that that has not been sufficiently, you know, uh, led to uh, national discipline. No, it's easy to criticize, no. But what has, uh, I will stop now, but what has been said uh, that you have to regain, and that's uh, people like Sylvie Goulard and many others who have been in politics also in the parliament, you have to regain the trust of the population and, and, and regain that in all these institutions, not only we, but all these institutions, it is true that uh, in the mindset, and someone mentioned this morning, who did it, the younger generation that have known, you know, the austerity. I mean, think about Yanis is there for Greece. It is clear that for the younger people, when you say the euro is good because it facilitates transaction, on the hand, it's associated to austerity and one of the biggest crises, you know, I mean, the country has ever had. Uh, so, I mean, these are the things, uh, uh, Greece, it's true, everybody can use his judgment on a country like Greece. But on the other hand, you also see the sufferings, you know, of that population. So, in, in, in my, in my, in my uh, attitude, it was relatively simple because I say we have a mandate. We say risk to price stability very often. Uh, we had, now of course we can criticize you did it too much or too little, but I mean that has been the driving force. The acid test, of course, if it had been different, you get price pressures, and then you, that's uh, maybe Philip, you are going to see that one day. But I mean, here, uh, it is not that we do too, too much for governments, we are too lenient. No, because you have your mandate. And I think that's, uh, you know, we're still struggling, you know, to get, you know, that close to 2%. I, your question, Adam, I mean, we love each other uh, because, uh, <laughs> Adam, because he's a brilliant mind. And, uh, and uh, you remember we, s we, we were sitting together years and years ago in uh, the Bellagio Group, as yep. we call it, which brought academics with central bankers and ministers of finance. Yep. And it was great people, you know, uh, Raghu Rajan and yep. plenty, plenty of uh, very good, Mario Rosfeld and people like this. And uh, Benoit, you were also there in, the, in that group. And uh, we were sitting some, very often, and it's true that um, it's important to listen to what you say. You, don't, you, you need to put the inflation target higher. Uh, you know, first, you have to do that. I think all discussion, I'm looking at some of my colleagues, the discussions about strategy has to be very carefully brought. First, you know, if you say we need a new strategy, it doesn't mean that the old strategy has failed. I think the strategy that we have followed works. And I really, I'm convinced of that. Actually, you will not believe me, but I, I'm convinced of that. Uh, and the reason, why don't you reach your objective? Well, try to do that when you get all these trade shocks, you know, and Brexit shocks, you know, that come in. I think the strategy was fine. So it's not reminded. That's for the past. I acknowledge the discussion for the future. If, and that's, I think, we should have a, a very open mind on this. Don't misread me. And on the future, you come with one ID. I will come with other IDs on this. Now I'm still, you know, member of the governing council. But I mean, on the other IDs, I pick up a few things. Now, then I'll stop on this. I pick up the ID of, well, your ID of your the level of inflation you mentioned. 
I would put on the table this question, is it true that this institution has reacted in an asymmetric way? I don't, well, I know the staff is working on this, but I know there is a lot of talk about this. I would like to clarify that. Some of my colleagues have done, even Mario has alluded to that. I think that's a conversation we can certainly have if it needs to be clarified further, because there was a clarification in 2003. The other example is what we call, we reach it in the medium term. And then I get in the market sometimes, you know, I was confronted very much. You know, I said to, to medium, medium to the long term, medium to the long term. <laughs> Given the nature of the shock, which are shocks we haven't seen since the 30s, it's obvious that these sort of things you cannot just do in the, the normal targeting period of, of two years and maybe three years. So the flexible targeting where the horizon is medium term and then you stretch your horizon in a, you know, very much leads to questions about credibility. So it's very important that in that sort of situation, you really show determination, no compromise. And you, you, you stick to that. And sometimes, of course, you say there are collateral damages and all that. I, I mean, that's mine. I think I share that uh, probably a little bit with, with Mario. You have, to go, you have to go that way. And, uh, and you try to deal with the other the best you can. But I mean, you, you, just, you just have to do what you have to do. Now, I understand this is not easy. The question, the next question, of course, is the, the uh, we have a two-pillar strategy. Well, the two-pillar strategy, you know, you look at the economy and then you look at the monetary pillar. That was Otmar, you know, uh, contribution. And we, we, there's a lot of work on this. And uh, you have to put it in the context of these years. That has evolved very much over the years. And it is true, I look again at, uh, at Isabel, uh, a lot of this has been done, as a lot of work has been done on what we call the second pillar. No, it was the first in the beginning, now it became the second, which is the monetary pillar. We look in the, indeed at the transmission mechanism in the, and the amplification mechanism that you can have, the fragmentation issues. So there's enormous knowledge which has been built up, you know, uh, by the staff and has been extremely useful. I, I will mention that in Sintra, maybe that sort of issue. The next one, of course, in the in sort of strategic reflection that everybody has, you know, anyway in the staff, I mean, everybody has that on, on, on the mind, is of course, to, and that's Isabel again, how much do you integrate the financial stability consideration within the normal monetary policy discussion? And uh, we have to reflect very carefully about this sort of thing. It's not obvious. And you quickly go with the an additional instrument question, which is an instrument which is shared with, usually with other authorities. So that reflection is not something you can just launch like this, and it's careful reflections on this. I think I had a few other points, for example, the non-standard measures. If we think the non-standard measures are going to become the standard measures because you get low rates, low rates now at the peak of the cycle, suppose you know, the cycle goes down from that level, uh, it is clear that you have to think about your toolbox, the non-standard becomes a standard. I think, uh, Victor, uh, in your farewell last year, you, 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 that was one of the points. So you have to think in, in terms of how do you work, given, of course, the difficulties of using and also the political related issues that you have to that. To very conclude on this, uh, from the beginning, I think there is a big priority, because you asked me, Claire, always the priorities. I think the, 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 the conversation uh, with the people, with the, the population, is absolutely of key, and I know we are convinced of that. I'm not afraid of that. They don't understand very much what's inflation. They're very confused with different things. Uh, but uh, people are not unreasonable uh, in general. Uh, but they're very bit captured by some, some people. So it's mm -hmm. easy, in a way, to capture the attention the other way. Uh, <laughs> you have to be the, find the people <laughs> doing that. But it's a, it's a lot of work, because we took a lot of distance you know, from those being able to talk to the people in a wrong way. And, uh, and I think that we, have, we need this reflection among you know, people, the elite uh, sort of communication. It's difficult to do in a way, but it's not that difficult because people in the end are relatively reasonable in the end, if you can really explain you know, what you're doing. Uh, but I, maybe that's my dream, uh, but uh, we'll see. Okay. So could we um, take some questions from the floor, please? I'll do what we did in the previous Stephen, panel and take, yeah. take three and then, and then return to the panel. So first, Vito, please. And Stefan, could you?
Uh, thank you, Claire. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, to uh, speak from the floor first and foremost to pay my homage to uh, Peter Pratt for all the work that he has done and the way he has worked to really keep consensus and uh, a spirit, a team spirit uh, in the governing council, which has been very important. But I have, I have two points. Um, the first one is to underline the importance of what Jean said by, for the first time in the two panels, raising the issue of the European safe asset. Because it's something that is crucial, in my view. It serves several objectives. Mm -hmm. It's essential for several objectives. Yeah. We won't have a CMU without having a real European safe asset. And by the way, the European safe asset cannot be just transforming each sovereign debt of each member country as safer than what they are now. There will be always uh, uh, nuances in credit risk and other factors, liquidity uh, and so on, affecting uh, the uh, different uh, countries. So we need really something at the European level. So no CMU without the safe asset, no more internationalization of the euro without the safe asset, and no solution, no smooth solution to the problem of the concentration of a bank's portfolio in domestic debt without the European, a true European safe asset. And there are solutions that do not involve mutualization. So the question is how to motivate the governments, the politicians, really to buy this idea. Because they speak a lot that they are all in favor of CMU, but they have not moved one inch in any domain that is essential for that project. The second uh, brief comment. Uh, reaction was to what Isabel said about transferring ELA to the European level, meaning the, the Euro system level. Um, well, uh, I am told that there are legal problems with that in the treaty. I say fortunately, because I think it would be something that it's not useful and could even be detrimental. Uh, why? Because already now, the governing council has to authorize when the levels, the amounts uh, raise, and so there is a lot of uh, you know, control, coordination, and, and all that. So uh, no need to transfer just because of that reason. Uh, but then think about what would happen in a big crisis. In normal times, it could work. But think what would happen in a big crisis like the one we had, where for two countries, ELA attained almost 100% of the GDP of those two countries. Would that sort of ELA would have been granted if the decision was, and the, and the risk was taken up at the uh, uh, Euro system level? So I leave you with that question mm -hmm. and uh, uh, to, for you to, to really think about the uh, role of ELA in big crisis management. Stefan Collignon. Thank you. Um, Jean, in his contribution, dismissed the role of inequality for monetary policy. But I think your staff is probably the only central bank in the world, as far as I know, who has done studies on the impact of inequality and wealth inequality and the implications that it has for monetary policy. In particular, it seems that there is higher volatility of wealth inequality due to the unconventional monetary policies. So I wonder if you could um, say something about that and put it in context. Thank you. I'm Livio Stracker from DCB. I just want also to give a bit uh, the perspective of DCB staff uh, in the interaction with Peter. I always find it very enriching. And Peter always had very difficult questions, which uh, I personally always found difficult to answer. So uh, has been enriching, but so demanding on, on our side, on set of staff. Uh, and in terms of the uh, question I would have is, uh, uh, it, so I, I find it very true that, uh, especially young people, 
uh, don't care too much about really, uh, especially the decimals of inflation. So it's very hard to then to say, uh, is it a big problem that inflation is 1.5 as opposed to 2%? You know, nobody really cares about that. Uh, everybody cares about climate. Uh, that is entirely true, but then the question is, what can we do uh, within our legal mandates and with what we can do in practice to, uh, to make progress on that? So in, in, in practice, what can we do on that? Thanks. Yeah, it's a Greenspan's curse, what you mentioned. Thank you. I'd, ju I'd just like to add one question myself. I mean, something that's come up a lot in the remarks is that, either directly or indirectly, is that we're operating in this era where there is a lot of public anger. I mean, Peter, you note that people are not unreasonable, but you do get the sense that people are scared. And there's a sense, too, where people are saying that central banks should be or should not be, in some cases, in engaging in these debates. So. I think I'd like to ask the panelists, in the era of fake news, the central banks need to get more involved in speaking with the public, or is there not a risk that that could backfire mm. and you end up mm. looking too politicised? Mm. And if we, if we can point. start with, with Peter's remarks on the questions, mm. that'd mm. be great. Mm. Really? Really? But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, That's you. okay with you. <laughs> well, but I can start the answers or to yours You first? can start the, uh, um, but the others, easy. no? Yeah. So leave, you, you leave your, your uh, anticipated what I wanted to say about the staff. Uh, later, I will say one thing on, on uh, the journalists and the media, uh, but the other thing I wanted to say before you ask the question is uh, grateful to the staff. There are many of my collaborators here and I really uh, are collaborators. So I hope I have been always uh, not very hierarchical with the Dutch way, you know, where we, we really <laughs> are flat, you know, and people can come up with their ideas. I hope, I hope, I, you never know how people judge you, but uh, that was, I hope, the spirit, as you said, leave you. I, I hope, uh, maybe difficult questions, I don't know, but, I, and the staff has been very creative, actually, maybe too, according to some of you, but, uh, but that means something. That means that, you know, that they have some freedom of thinking about uh, what to do. So the, the uh, inflation 1.5, uh, it is true, and that's uh, also a bit related to you. I mean, they say, oh, you're doing all this so from going from 1.5 to 1.8 or 1.9. It's a little bit the, 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 the very difficult to explain. It's a green span's curse in a way that uh, you succeed. Benoit, you said that at Sintra last, last year. You succeed in inflation when people don't, in their decisions, don't look at inflation anymore. Now, there is a little bit of problem with that, of course, because if they, they don't care between 0 and 2%, uh, you have a sign of the incurring. So it's, that's why we, cause, we call it a little bit a curse that uh, it's very difficult to explain why it's better to go close to two. That's why some people like you say you should go for three or something like this. Because if people don't really care anymore, it could go be zero or it could be two. So what, what is the anchor of the system? And then, of course, your nominal rate you know, starts from a very low level if it's closer to zero. In 2003, the ECD tries to, they say the definition of price stability, Vitor, you and, and some others, where it is between zero and 2%. So if you go to zero, you fulfill your mandate. Go to two, you fulfill your mandate. And then in 2003, for these reasons, you say it's better to be close, below, but close. And then came the question of asymmetry. Ah, it's two, it's, there's a hard border, and you are not so concerned if you go to zero. So, I mean, these are the things I mentioned in strategic sort of reflection. It's one part that, if needed, uh, if needed, you have to clarify. But Livio, you're quite right. I mean, it's difficult to explain this question that it makes a difference indeed. If people don't care, it's a success. If they don't care, you're closest to zero. It's the curse of Greenspan. I think it was called Greenspan's curse. And how you deal, I don't know, but uh, we stick to, to close to 2% or something like this. But uh, the question of uh, St uh, Stefan, Stefan on uh, monetary policy and wealth inequality. I mean, my position is... Matthias, you remember, we worked many years ago about uh, the impact of inflation, unexpected inflation. You were young. Uh, <laughs> you're still younger <laughs> uh, than me. Uh, I think it remains. It remains. Um, and uh, it's true that with Matthias, uh, I worked you know, uh, on uh, the redistribution impact of inflation. And not of monetary policy. Well, in a way, yes, because monetary policy tolerated inflation. There were huge redistributional shock. I didn't have many ideas about uh, academic work, but I had this idea that when you look at the national accounts, you don't see this redistributional impact of inflation. 
That's how I got to in the IMF, I think, because they thought it was good that people worked on that AD, which was at that time not very much. And when you came back from Harvard, you say, well, you have to look at human capital also. There can be capital losses on human capital and things. And then we, that's how we, we start. But to go back on, on the question about wealth effects, well, what we think is in our monetary policy is that uh, if you can stabilize inflation, well, you minimize the redistribution effect of unexpected inflation, but also unexpected defla I mean, deflationary question. Now, the instruments you use, indeed, uh, for example, if you do QE, and you say, I do QE by buying equities directly, obviously, uh, it, it has an impact, of course, a direct impact on equity prices on wealth distribution. And then we can discuss about other ways to do that. It is true that it's challenging, because when you, if you would go in equities, uh, because I take the extreme case for just for the discussion, right. Uh, you immediately get the question from the people, why don't you do QE for the people then, rather than QE for the capitalist? Mm -hmm. And so it's true that these are whole new challenges of communication. And when you get this instrument, you know, this lower bond issue, there are plenty of political questions coming in, of course, like this. So it is, it is indeed, uh, I, I talked to Philip and the colleagues here, it is not an easy situation when you are in the zero lower bond, so you need the tools that you have. But there are new issues as the one you mentioned. But we had these big redistribution issues. But the population very often doesn't know that. You say the real rates in Germany were negative for many years. They have well, a lot of redistribution for inflation because the central banks you know, were not active enough in cutting you know, unexpected inflation. Uh, but um, now we get, uh, I think, income distribution <laughs> promised to be dealt by the government. And they don't have the courage to do that. So they go to the central bank. They can criticize the central bank. Uh, and I, I think that's uh, something, I'm sorry, they say, ah, yeah, you escaped the question, you know, and uh, you put it to the government. I didn't sign a contract, you know, to deal with uh, income distribution, wealth distribution. We didn't sign a contract on this. We know there are externalities of mm -hmm. our policy. Mm -hmm. Governments should discuss that and should act and not just put it uh, to the instrument. I mean, that's my point of view since always. I mean, that's, I have a simple contract. I mean, I, that, in that way, it's too much honor what you do now, because I'm, I'm a simple, simple bureaucrat, I would say, trying to do the best. If that's what history remains, it's already something. I mean, we try to do the best uh, in, in, in that contract, in that contract, which was given, signed, don't forget, by Merkel, Sarkozy, and plenty of important <laughs> people. I mean, uh, How could I forget? Yeah, you get it, no? Me <laughs> too. So maybe I, um, uh, so I, uh, I won't discuss the uh, uh, ILA issue because I will discuss that with Vitor over lunch if he's willing to, so it would be great. So I would like to discuss the, uh, the issue of communication because I think that's actually crucial. So if I, uh, if I look at the uh, perception of the ECB in Germany, this is very much um, dominated by simple narratives. And this is also true about, for, for example, uh, for uh, European deposit insurance. And so uh, there are these narratives, so the ECB is stealing the savers' money and uh, Target 2 is a time bomb and everything will be terrible. And um, I think the central banks have a very important, important educational role here uh, to talk to the people and explain the simple mechanisms. I think it's very dangerous to say they are not able to understand. Yes. I mean, I always say when I, when I teach my students, also they have a hard time understanding. But I try to kind of boil it down the way they, th that they understand. Yeah, but they don't read the Bild Zeitung. Your that's speech. true. <laughs> it's a different, it's, it's more challenging. But I mean, this is Indeed. something I think that central banks uh, have to do. I no, mean, I think they, they are partly already doing it. But I think this should be in intensified because for the acceptance of uh, monetary policy, and especially in Germany, that would be mm. uh, crucial to get these narratives out of the, out of the hats. And these, but that is very hard. Once they are there, it's very hard to convince people that, right. that, is, uh, that is not true. So when I give a, a public speech on something, in the end, someone stands up and, and asks, so uh, Hans-Werner Zinn told me about Target 2. What, what, how terrible is it? I mean, every time. <laughs> Every single time. Yeah. And so, I mean, I can then respond, but that's not enough. I mean, so the... the that's why you're sitting like, there, by the way, also. It's because of what you say now. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, really, Isabel. Thank you. Um, so, I, I was the one who, for all what I said, who ducked saying what would the world would be like in 2027 because mm -hmm. I, I had, of course, in my head the, the negative opposite of Peter's lovely story of the world that Philip will get to rule over. Um, so let me, let me just put on one more positive spin. I think 
I think that there are two great opportunities here for the European Central Bank. And one is just to emphasize what John said. The US government is throwing a lot away. It's not going to get it back anytime soon, even if it pretends to. Uh, there's both a need and an opportunity for the international role of the euro. And that will, I think, increase, as Vitor said, as Jean said, as others have said, the possibility and the feasibility and the viability of a euro safe asset, which has major views. So I just want to strongly associate myself with Jean on that point. The second point is I want to take something Isabel said and others have said about the overburdening of the central bank and flip that around. I think you should actually look at the fact that the central banks now have to deal with financial stability in a more overt way as an opportunity for broadening the legitimacy of the central bank. We had a speech at our Peterson Institute about a month and a half ago by Lisetja Kaganyago, the governor of the South African Reserve Bank, mm -hmm. um, which I asked him to do on central bank independence. And his message, as I hoped and expected, was that central bank independence isn't really just about the inflation bias and, and the, the credibility of that. Central bank independence is in part about sitting there and doing the right thing apolitically in the society with respect to the monetary and financial system. And obviously, in the context of South Africa, that's a very high stakes, big thing to say. But Stan Fisher, who spoke last night and who had to run off, uh, also gave a talk at our institute two years ago in which he, he echoed Martin Wolf and said, you know, one problem with the central bank's response and everybody's response to the financial crisis was not enough bankers went to jail. And I would take these two points together, and obviously, despite the thick walls, this building is not meant to hold people in jail. Um, but just to say that central banks can build their credibility with the public by forthrightly dealing with financial issues. And that's a way of demonstrating that they are impartial, that they care about welfare, that they're basically trying to do the right thing. And it goes to Peter's point about just being reasonable. And so I think rather than looking at that as, oh my god, we have a burden, and oh my god, we have dual mandates, and oh my god, I would look at it as an opportunity to deliver on credibility in the broad sense of the central banks as guardians of fair play and decency in the society. Um, let me say I, I entirely agree with what uh, Vitor said on safe assets, and let me not go back to it. I'd like to respond to Stefan about inequality, and I, I would agree with you that uh, inequality is fundamentally something that you know, central banks may, may care about the consequences of what they are doing, but they don't have the instruments to, to address it. I mean, that's the business of the government for very good reasons. You know, we have a, something that's called a tax system, uh, the transfer system, and we have a, a parliament to, to, to take responsibility for it. So I think I would refrain from, from thing, you know, going beyond the fact that you have to observe and you have to assess the consequence of what you're doing. Now, climate change <coughs> is, in my view, different because, uh, I mean, to, to go back to what Livio was asking, you know, I'm not convinced by the strategy that these institutions have followed as regards climate change. Basically, they're following Marconi, they say it's a financial stability problem. Uh, we can address it within our mandate uh, for financial stability, but it has nothing to do with, with monetary policy, except that we may have to take into account the consequence of climate change or of climate uh, policy uh, for the economy and therefore in this regard for, for monetary policy. I mean, I wonder why it's a problem for financial stability more than some other factors of, uh, of instability, like technology risk, like, you know, many, like geopolitical risks, like many others that are not addressed in the same way by, by central bank. Um, and turning to the, the uh, monetary policy dimension, I mean, certainly it's not something, you know, I said it's a, it's a, price, it's a relative price problem fundamentally, and this relative price problem cannot be addressed by, by monetary policy. Uh, but at the same time, it's a, it's, a, it's a major issue of credit allocation for the medium to long term uh, uh, in a certain direction with a major credibility problem behind, 
which is that, uh, again, governments are just unable to commit to the future price of carbon that would trigger the investment. And I wonder whether the answer to that is just to say, we deal with the financial stability issue and we separate that completely from the, the monetary. So I don't have the, the response to the, but I'm saying the question uh, is deeper than the, the, the answer that's being provided, which by itself is not entirely convincing in my view. Mm. On, just, on, on, on just very briefly okay. on this, um, in my mind, uh, I, I put it as a, as a sort of supply shock. You know, what is the impact of uh, China? I mean, uh, years ago when they joined the WTO and the World Trade System on, uh, on monetary policy. So there, uh, and there you, you have changes in relative prices, maybe with taxation, you know, disruptions, you know, in the... In, so it's the same sort of supply shock, which is, uh, but the point you, you make here is a sort of lasting shock, which so far we don't see much actually, yeah? but it's a lasting shock that may come. I would put it in the, in the normal framework that we do, you know, when you assess, you know, the environment and you say, well, inflation looks weak, you know, and, and, and persistently weak. You try to assess which are, you know, the sort of supply shock or not. And that may explain, is it more demand? Is it supply? If it's supply, you try to see, is it sort of lasting shock? which it complicates very much the monetary policy, of course. But that, that sort of discussion we had about China, for example, and the impact on inflation worldwide. You say there is another shock which is in the making, but which we haven't seen yet much, actually, that may come in the future. I think it could come in the normal framework. I think so. What you're saying is that it's in certain sort of exogenous shocks that comes from either, I mean, the yeah, climate yeah. shock and the, the action of governments, yeah, yeah, and the yeah. response to the yeah, climate shock, yeah, yeah, yeah. and all that is exogenous for the central bank. I mean, if you, if, well, you, if you look at what yeah. the, the climate community, uh, the way the climate community thinks, mm -hmm. they're desperate, you know, because they're not able to convince government to act through, through taxation. Mm -hmm. And they're all into, you know, finding ways to act through essentially credit. Okay? No, but that's uh, a different so, thing. That's no, but that's a different thing. But that's, that's a pressure you're going to yeah, feel. Yeah, no, that's or that's your successor are going that, to feel. That we know. And what I'm saying is that, this is an issue you have to, to you know, I'm not saying you have to yeah. uh, just to, to, to abide to, yeah. to, to, to the I pressure, understand. to vote to the yeah. pressure. Yeah. I'm saying it's yeah. an issue you have to think about more deeply. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Yeah. And just before giving um, Peter the final word, I'd just like to um, say thanks, um, pay, 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 pay some words of gratitude just for all the help you've given us, me as journalists and the, and the rest of the media, I think you mentioned that, you know, you always try to be honest and I think that's something that's shone through. <laughs> You've really tried to answer our questions as, as, as best as you, you could, no matter how tough they are. And I'd also like to say thanks caveat, to you. Caveat, you know, <laughs> caveat. But, uh, um, uh, but just as a European too, that, you know, I'm sure I'm not the only one in, in the room concerned about the elections later this week. Mm -hmm. I think we all know the project isn't mm -hmm. perfect, but I think your ideas and your commitment have really cushioned Europe from some pretty serious blows, both from outside and within. So you should be justly proud of that. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, please. Maybe, maybe. No, I really, please. as I said, you know, I'm, I'm just a bureaucrat trying to fulfill this simple mandate. No, but there is, there is one community I didn't uh, thank, and uh, so I wanted to keep it for the end. Actually, as you know, uh, I usually uh, cannot read a speech because uh, probably uh, my mother being German, she learned French at the same time as me. Uh, and uh, I, never, I can never read a text correctly in French, usually. So the, the, the way of doing that is just, I don't read the text, I just speak, you know, and, uh, which, which, which makes it, you no, know, but which makes it and stand, you know, that's how we start to know each other better years ago. He said, it's, 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 uh, you told me that at the, in Washington once, you know, because we uh, stick to our notes. And uh, I must be, no, really, I mean it, very grateful to a number of people sitting here because you always... I don't know exactly the reason, but you always protected me in a way because you could have, you know, really make headlines, you know, about what I was saying. You never did, actually, and I'm grateful not only you, but a number of people I see in the room here. No, no, uh, wait, wait another 10 days, huh? <laughs> but you never did that. And then I was asking myself the question, Claire, uh, there are two explanations, unfortunately, the good and the bad. The, but I think it's a good one. The good one, they just 
want to protect me and they, 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 they just want to, you know, iron a little bit what I said. So that's the good one. The other one is they don't understand what I say. <laughs> <laughs> and so they go back to the written text, you know, which, uh, and then they just, the third explanation I would never take is they're too lazy. So they just uh, read and take a few quotes from the text. But the result, the result actually, and what I want to say about the, the press, you, of course, you know, you play a key role. And, uh, and I, it's not always optimum, as Isabel, you alluded, not only in, in Germany. Uh, and I can understand that, you see, and, and it's part of our efforts also to do. I mean, it's, it's not, but uh, I mean, I must say the people I met from the press, I must say I cannot complain personally. Uh, maybe my colleagues could, I don't know, but I, I personally never complain, uh, which you better not do <laughs> in any case. But I must say this, this, my experience has been very good with, uh, with a number of people here present, actually. Uh, you, we met, we met, do you remember when we met the first time? You don't remember? <laughs> she remembered that she doesn't want to say, you see, that's the issue. <laughs> no, you were very young. You see? <laughs> No, I, what I mean is no, that she started, she, started, uh, she started business, and I was in London making, making speeches as usual. I was not yet in the public sector. And I remember you had your, the first conversations we had at that time. And uh, it's true that I thought, and this is a little bit uh, part of my character, I only want to teach people, you know, things. And uh, so I, I remember that, you don't remember maybe, but that was a <laughs> long time ago. But the age differential has, has remained, you know, that's, that's cool. <laughs> No, thank you, Claire. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much.